Let's be honest. That's our, our default mode. Our default mode is we want justice. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be consequences for wrongs. What I'm talking about is what's in this passage. Let's look at our own story in light of everything when it comes to forgiveness. We stand beneath a debt that could never be repaid. Yet God, it says, who is rich in mercy, even while we were yet his enemies in Romans chapter 5, he says almost the exact same thing. Christ died for us. He did not treat us as our sins deserved. One of the things that we see in this passage amongst these three things is this as well. Forgiving is more than just words. It's more than just lip service. You'll notice the very end of the passage, if you go back and look, it says that unless you forgive from the heart. This means that we can, we sometimes say with our lips, I forgive you, but still hold the offense against someone in our hearts. And this is the, the crucial point that makes me include this subtle sin of unforgiveness. This is why. Because I fear that you, like me, have someone that you've held unforgiveness towards for some time. Am I right? Like, who, who is that person? Who did you write down? I remember... Uh, in one of my Bible school classes, one of the assignments that we were given um, was so impressionable. It's the almost of all of the things I learned in Bible school, this is the thing that stuck with me the most. One of the assignments was that we had to examine our own hearts and see if there was anyone in our lives that we had refused to forgive. I didn't have to think about it very long. There was a name immediately. I knew who it was right away. I'm not going to tell you who it is. Now, mind you, I'd already been in ministry for over three years, Pastor Mike, but I had that unforgiveness, bitterness, actually, hatred in my heart for this man. In my head and in my heart, was that refrain, you don't know what he did to me. If you knew what he did to me, you wouldn't forgive him either. This man had mentally and emotionally and even physically, thankfully not sexually, abused me in different forms for over a number of years. And there was no way in hell I was going to forgive him. It just wasn't. He hurt me too bad. Truthfully, I just didn't have it in me. I had too much hatred in me. I had too much animosity towards him. I had nothing to, to offer that. The only thing I could do, and I'm so glad I did, is I cried out to Jesus for both the desire and the strength to actually forgive this man. The verses that we're looking at today were some of what the Lord Jesus was showing me then. It took on a whole new weight, I promise you. I started with the sense of a, of a conviction that I just hadn't had before. That grew in my heart until I couldn't bear it anymore. I had to forgive this guy. And suddenly, I was awakened, honestly, and I mean it as though it happened today, to the poison and bitterness, the unforgiveness was causing in my own heart. As though what he had done wasn't worthy of being forgiven, but everything I could ever do was. I remember the day, the very moment actually, that the Holy Spirit finally exposed this to me. I totally remember where I was sitting. I remember <laughs> what time of day it was. I even remember that it was a sunny day. The weather was great. But I remember weeping literally, before the Lord, asking him to forgive me for harboring this unforgiveness in my heart towards that guy. The thing I remember most is 
experience the sense of freedom that I experienced. Let me tell you, it's as though this huge, heavy backpack had been lifted off my back. Unbelievable sense of lightness. To, to just help understand that, I, when I work out, uh, one of the things that's part of like a regiment that I do is called rucking. Anybody know what rucking is? Yeah, it's um, something that they do in the military. They put heavy backpacks on and they march with them. And so I thought Will, since Will was such a helpful volunteer this morning, why don't you come on up, Will? I just wanted you to carry the, the backpack that I use for rucking for a minute. Come on up. Help yourself. It's right here. All right. So I, this will cut it in quarters. You'll only have to do four miles. <laughs> hey, here, let's, let's put it on. There you go. All right, just do a lap for us. Sure, don't have to run. It's okay. I don't want you to hurt your knees. Your coach isn't here. He's not exaggerating. It's 40 pounds. And you walk with that for a while, and you know it. You can come on down this aisle. I'll cut it short for you. Three quarters of a lap. You're doing the whole thing. But right? Yeah. It's heavy. Now, just go ahead and gently take it off and lay it down. And you, you just feel so much better, doesn't it? Thank you. You feel lighter. And I mean, that's the, that's, I couldn't think of a better way to say that. That was once I emptied that bitterness, emptied that forgiveness out by the power of the Holy Spirit, I felt like I can, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. It, the weight, that's how it feels, Jesus says, when we forgive. When we lay down the weight of that sin or that hurt at the feet of Jesus, it's like emptying the burdens out of our backpacks. Now, the difficulty, of course, is that sometimes we come back around the back door and pick those things back up again instead of leaving them there. To refuse to forgive will only weigh you down. And actually, worse, Jesus says, if we refuse to forgive, he says it so much indicates that you are not forgiven from the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. That's, that's huge. That goes beyond just an illustration now. Because now he's actually making a statement about my eternal well-being. This is Jesus talking. So that means there's a really strong, strong warning to those who are unforgiving. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Don't you wish these passages were not in the Bible? Could we just cut them out, please? Because if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father. Or Mark, whenever you pray, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, also who is in heaven, may forgive you. Our call to forgive is completely empowered and born out of our being forgiven, as we see in Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Yeah, those are passages of Scripture that we have to just let them sit for a while, seep in there for a bit, and let them work in our hearts, and so that we can go before the Lord with that name or that face of that person and say, Oh God, I didn't know. 
Give me the desire and the power to actually forgive. One of the things that will happen as a result of being forgiven like that is we are transformed to being forgivers because we're forgiven. And we realize this, that forgiving is more than words, but it's also very, very expensive. Forgiving costs something. 10,000 talents is just an example. One talent. Your book, your Bible, if you have footnotes, it tells you this. I'm not just some brilliant guy. You, you know that. But one talent is equal to 20 years wages. That's like a, what? And how many talents were there? 10,000, right? He'd been forgiven 10,000 talents. Stick with me here. 10,000 talents times 20 years wages, what's that give us? 200,000 years. That's how much this guy owed him. 200,000 years worth of wages. And the master said, don't worry about it. I forgive you. I forgive you. That means he had to pay for it. He he had to pay for it. It was expensive for that master to forgive that servant. So he goes out, and he meets up this other dude, and this guy owes him 100 denarius. Now, one denarius is equivalent to one day wage. So this guy who had just been given 200,000 years, goes out and says to the guy who owes him just 100 days, and he he won't do it. Notice in the parable that the servant asked for more time. I think that's important to recognize. The servant asked for more time, but the master didn't just delay the payment. He didn't just delay the payment. He forgave it. That means... The master had to absorb that cost. He had to take it upon himself. And Jesus' point is, is so uncomfortably clear that this servant was forgiven much. And Jesus says that those who are forgiven much do what? What does Jesus tell us about people who are forgiven much? They love much, right? But this guy didn't get the memo. Jesus uses another instance to tell that point. In in Luke chapter 6, he says, and one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table and behold, a woman of the city, a prostitute. We're not supposed to be with Jesus, apparently. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she had learned that Jesus was reclining at the table at the Pharisee's house, she brings in an alabaster flask of ointment And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she begins to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Drastic measures. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, (laughs) if, if this guy were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is who's touching him. She is a sinner. And Jesus looks at him. Now, mind you, this guy just was thinking this, but Jesus answered him. His name was Simon, the Pharisee. I have something to say to you. And he's like, go ahead, say it. He's feeling all good about himself. Listen to this. A certain money lender had two debtors. Sound familiar? One who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. A lot and hardly any. Neither of them could pay, so he canceled the debt of both of them. Now, which of them do you suppose loves him more, Simon? And Simon answers, the one, I suppose, for whom the canceled debt was larger. And Jesus says to him, you have right, you're, you judged rightly. But then turning to the woman, he still addresses Simon, but he looks at the woman. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. And you gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I've come in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, 
but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, for she has loved much, will be forgiven. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table began to say among themselves, who is this that he even forgives sins? Jesus exposes something in our hearts here. He exposes certainly something in the Pharisee's heart. 